Howdy, Mark Serbu, gun designer, gun nut, here in my shop on a coronavirus weekend. <laughs> First of many, I'm sure. Today I'm going to do a kind of a minimalist video because, you know, I, I work really hard sometimes on these things and then the the, uh, the the helpful folks at YouTube just arbitrarily will demonetize a video. And it doesn't matter. There's no rhyme or reason to why they do it. It's like they'll just say, oh, sorry, we demonetize you. And, and you give, tell them to do a manual check to to verify and it's like nah sorry and and there's no there's they never give you a reason it's just yeah we don't like you fuck you you're a gun person you know whatever but anyway today interesting stuff um we're going to be looking at some of the uh extractors from different nine millimeters um uh you know i had that issue with the rof and you guys seem to like the rof submachine gun stuff so uh i'm gonna keep looking at it e even though it's like i did the ejector one and YouTube was like, okay, that's fine. You can, that, that can be monetized. And then I showed the fire control and they're like, no, nah, sorry, fuck you, you know, but again, arbitrary, but <laughs> same things too. I mean, I didn't show a gun firing there and you can show a gun firing as long as it's on a range. But anyway, today I've got kind of an eclectic mix of nine millimeter carbine and submachine gun bolts. Some of which you may recognize, some of which you probably won't. So obviously we've got the ROF here, and this is a Uzi. This is a um, Keltec, Keltec that the little fold-up nine-millimeter carbine. And this one, I bet nobody will guess that one. As you can see by the lack of a fixed firing pin, it is a closed bolt gun. Just yeah, these inner two are closed bolt. These outer two have fixed firing pins and are open bolt. You know, ROF Uzi open bolt Keltec, and I'm going to go ahead and give it away. That's from the Ruger. MP9 submachine gun. You hardly ever see those things, very rare. So we're gonna take a look and see how uh, the extractors work on these things, how well they work, and uh, some interesting findings. Okay, first up is the Uzi. Now I've got a fired case here, and uh, I'm just gonna slip it underneath the extractor there. Now, what I'm trying to figure out here is, is how tough is it to get that out of the extractor, first of all. Now I'm sticking a sticking a punch down here. I'm trying to pull it out, and man, there's no getting it out of there. You're you're gonna break something. It's just not gonna let go. That's got a ton of holding force, and of course it'd be nice to see how it kicks the shell out, but it it won't stay in there. But but see, it's it's got a lot of a lot of spring to it. Very good at kicking the shell out. You know, I don't even have I don't. It won't stay down, but. But you can just see, as soon as I let go, it just easily gets that sucker out of there. And next up is the kel -Tec. And it's a cute little bolt. It actually has a whole big giant piece of bar that hooks onto the back of it to add to the mass. But uh, anyway, there it is. It'll just sit there on the bolt face, no problem. Um, and let's see how it... First of all, the holding force. If I want to pry that out of there, no, it's not going anywhere. It's got a lot of holding force. Now, how will this kick out of the gun? Yeah, does a good job. And something very important that, if you don't know it already, I'm going to show you today. You see where the, uh, obviously the spring that drives this thing is right here. The pivot point's right there. So they're about uh, pretty close to the same distance. So whatever force this spring puts on it here, it puts the same force laterally here. Um, and it's not, it's not extremely difficult to push that thing out of the way. Because you the case will cam it, hits that angled surface and it'll cam it out of the way. And that's what happens as the bolt goes into battery. Okay, and it's got more force than I can exert here with having only two hands and not a steady support for the bolt but anyway the one of the keys to having this thing have such good holding force and not wanting to cam out when you when you load this case is no matter how hard you pull on this the line of action is just about in line with the pivot point so that makes it extremely difficult for any force that's pulling on that to try to make this rotate and compress the spring It'll only compress the spring when it's shoving in straight in and it hits that 45 degree angled surface and pushes it that way. I'll show you that in a, uh, on the whiteboard in a bit here. 
And here's the Ruger MP9 bolt. It's uh, really interesting because it's got a, uh, it, this is just a little insert out of uh, the inside of the bolt. Uh, it looks like an Uzi bolt, but it's, uh, it just goes in this pocket here just to, uh, uh, just easier to manufacture this way instead of having to come in here from a great distance and try to, uh, you know, machine all that intricate stuff on the bolt face. So anyway, that's kind of cool. But the main thing we're looking at is the extractor and this one cams out of the way pretty easily. And, you know, it's got some, it puts some lateral force on the case. So when it gets out of the gun, it gets it out there pretty well. And we'll try to, eh, can't, can't get that out of there. That sucker is, uh, you know, it's got a lot of holding force. And again, here we go, there's the pivot point. On this extractor, it has a much greater distance from the pivot point to the end uh, versus the pivot point to the spring, but it's got a pretty powerful spring. It's, it's very hard to push that in. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get that out of there. Of course, I misplaced my little punch. Let me go find that. Now this is a shiny example of doing something right. You can see that is, you know, the force that the, the case puts on there, when the case is being pulled on, the line of action is just on this side of that pivot point. It's pretty close to being on center. That's, that's really good. Uh, this, and like a lot of Rugers, this, the Ruger parts, this is a casting. Ruger is just really good at casting stuff. But uh, it's a nice extractor. It's got a, it almost looks like it's, uh, has a down angle to it on that, that hook, but I don't know, I think it's, no, I don't think so. But very nicely done, very positive, very strong. Works great. Okay, I don't know what I was thinking, but how could I do this without using a Sten bolt for a comparison? Jeez, come on. All right, so here are a couple Sten bolts, and uh, you know, this is what I was playing with when I first started out. A Sten, you know, Sten parts kits were like between ten and thirty dollars, dirt cheap, and you know, there are literally millions of them out there, and they were a very basic, you know, World War II submachine gun, very cheap to make and all that stuff. Anyway, um, so snap that sucker on. It snaps in easily. Um, am I blocking that completely? Yeah. So snaps into place, and then once it's in there. You can't, you can't get that out. It's very, the extractor does its job very well. And uh, just in case, you know, here's the second one. Same deal, very hard to get that out of there. And as you can see, the pivot point is right in line with that. So again, you don't have a tendency to wanna unhook this by force placed on the extractor hook. Now, just for the fun of it, this bolt is from the British Patchet or Sterling submachine gun, which is an updated version of the Sten, and uh, pretty much similar type of extractor. Uh, they've got this surface machined way, like someone suggested in one of my videos, to help uh, get the rounds out. Um, but here's something interesting. Um, doesn't hold it very well. Does, you know, snaps into place there but you can fairly easily get that extractor to, to cam out of the way. Look at that. Um, and what do we have here? It's the pivot point is kind of in line with that. We're gonna have to take that out there and take a look because yeah, it doesn't hold very well. That got a second one here to look at just to see if that's a fluke. And no, this one's even weaker. So that's interesting. And last, and in this case, least, <laughs> last and certainly least, the ROF bolt. And this is the worst of the bunch. Now, it'll barely hold it on there. And look, a, a freaking mosquito landing on that could knock it out of engagement. So that's pretty poor. And it looks to me like it's not even completely um, snapping the extractor hook is not even completely snapping over the rim. Um, 
that's problem number one. And problem number two, the spring just is not powerful. And problem number three, this, this is considerably, you know, out of alignment with the hook as far as the line of action, uh, you know, the line of action of the force of the case versus the pivot point. It's not that far out, but it's far enough out. Yeah. Something else I want to point out about my crappy design. Um, this is one, one thing, you know, I did this uh, again 22 years ago and I'm, what am I, 58? So I was, I was like 20 then. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was obviously uh, 36. Um, so, you know, I had a mechanical engineering degree at that point, but I hadn't made that many guns and, you know, sometimes when you're designing stuff, it's just, I don't know, you just kind of crap stuff out and don't give it too much thought and, and sometimes you don't learn until something breaks. Well, this, this, you know, I don't know why I wanted this at 90 degrees. I wanted the ejector to, to kick out and be exactly 180 degrees away from the extractor and of course, you know, 90 degrees from vertical. Um, and there's no reason to kick this out directly sideways. If you'll notice all these other bolts, they're all at some sort of angle. Like this looks like it's about, a, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 degree angle up. Um, the UZ and the Sten, well, the Sten, maybe that's why I was copying Sten, which is 180 degrees apart from the extractor to the ejector. But this would have been much better to have this, this slot here rotated up I don't know, at least 30 degrees, because look at this. Look at how thin that is. That is like paper thin there, and uh, that's just dumb. I mean, I look at that now, and you know, I'm thinking, what was I thinking? And I wasn't, but, you know, and one of the main things that's a killer about doing this sort of stuff is when you have that thin of a section and you're case hardening, this is 8620 steel, and it's case hardened, and the depth is like 15 to 30 thousandths. Well, you look at this right here, that's that's not even 10 thousandths thick. So that means that sucker is hard all the way through. So that's just rock hard. And of course, hard means easily cracked. And here, after all these years, I got looking at it. And let's see if I can zoom in here. Let me get a brush on the subject. All right, I don't know if uh, you can see in the camera there, but there's a freaking crack right here. Goes from here right up to the hole. Like, wow, I never knew that. And it's, you know, totally expected. I just never really looked at it before. Damn, I wish I could uh, zoom in with some sort of a... Uh, I'll see if I can put a loop on there and get some higher magnification. Well, I don't know. I can't, uh, can't really do it. <laughs> it's too hard to get all this to work right. But uh, let's go ahead and get that sucker out of there. And there's another crazy thing too. The pivot pin for the extractor, when it's you know, it's got it's got a little bit of meat on this side for the the pin to be in inside, but over here it's you know it's got almost nothing to bear against. Um, and let's let's go ahead and measure that thickness there. Uh, I was wrong. Twelve thousandths of an inch. That's that's still insanely thin. And if you take a look at the extractor, um, here's a big part of the problem right there. I mean, that thing is, it doesn't really have, <laughs> it doesn't really have much to grab. There's not much of a hook there. So what I really need to do is, is re-machine this so that little notch there is considerably deeper and then maybe even uh, cut a radius in there so it can, it can get deeper on the case because this thing has just, just no holding force. It's uh, the line of action it's pretty good. It's it's fairly close to the pivot point. That's not really its big problem. Its big problem is that there's just hardly anything right there to, to grab the rim. So this is hardened. It's I think it's through hardened material, but uh, carbide end mill will take care of that. So I'm going to just mill this a little bit deeper. And I might mill that off so it'll allow it to sit in farther. And we'll see how that goes. Okay, I've gone ahead and modeled up the RF bolt along with the extractor and I've got 9 millimeter ammo modeled up there just like I have a lot of ammo modeled up but, uh, you know it's kind of funny I had to reverse engineer the bolt just like I would to any other gun because you know I don't remember how this was dimensioned out so it's kind of funny Re reverse engineering my own stuff it's the designs almost completely cleared out of my mind from you know time and doing tons and tons of other designs over the years.
But anyway, um, you can see here, it doesn't look quite right. I, I, something just a little bit off in the modeling because, you know, there's, this thing doesn't even clear the rim. And uh, it obviously does. It, it's not that bad. It hooks over it at least a little bit. But again, that's imprecise modeling, but like I was saying before, I want to, instead of this surface here being flat, I'm going to have a curve that matches that radius right there, so it'll be able to move in a bit farther. And I don't know, I'll, I'll see if I need to move that surface back to so it'll hook it more reliably. And then uh, move, grind that or machine that surface away and machine the surface, not away, but machine it back so this whole thing will be able to move in farther so that it'll put tension on so when this thing when the shell kicks out it'll actually be able to put lateral force on it and, and kick it out reliably but now the the best thing here again you can see how thin that is there and the pin that uh, the extractor pivots on has just a tiny little bit of of meat to bite into there a lot more up here of course but it's still, still bad, and of course this is thin and cracked. So I came up with a better way to do this. I said, hey, why don't I just borrow the Uzi, the Uzi extractor? And here I've implemented that, that cutaway that we saw on the Sterling. Uh, and here's an Uzi extractor in there. And the Uzi's fantastic. It's just hella strong. And, and of course you see I've got it rotated up. It's not directly horizontal. It's not 180 degrees from the ejector. Okay, now the silver lining to all this extractor stuff is that in any kind of blowback operated gun, it's the case that's pushing on the bolt. So you actually don't need, and if you've seen my GB22 pistol videos, you can see that you don't need an extractor or ejector. Uh, the case follows the bolt out. Go check out that video if you haven't seen it. Look at the high speed video. And the case and the bolt move together regardless of whether there's an extractor because you know, obviously the case is doing the work to push the bolt back and it's interesting to watch to watch and if you don't have that stuff on a something that feeds from from a magazine you're not going to get reliable function because the case will just sometimes kick right back forward or it won't kick out of the ejection port at all because it doesn't have anything that wants to drive it out but a lot of the reason for the extractor is just to merely to have a pivot point for what you're doing over here so if you have your ejector just just kick on the, the back of the case right there, the case is going to want to just go forward. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit off of center line, so it's got some tendency to want it to pivot this way, but not necessarily. I've looked at a lot of high-speed video, and you'll see that it just kicks it straight forward, and then it smacks against the barrel face, and then it comes back against the bolt, and it just stays in the gun and jams up. So a lot of the function of the extractor is just to give you a pivot point to go about when you're kicking it on the other side. so And having it at an up angle obviously throws the case up a little bit as opposed to just sideways. So this is a really good solution, I think. And what's really cool about the Uzi extractor, it's very old school. You notice on all those other guns, you had a spring and a, a pivot point with the, the retaining pin. Here, the Uzi, again, old school. If you look at a lot of really old guns, they would just take a piece of steel and they would put a bend in it. It's a big, long beam. So it doesn't need to actually pivot about a pin with a spring. It's its own spring. This, let's just isolate that. Oops, come on. So you have a retaining pin, but it doesn't pivot. It, it, the pivoting happens just by bending of this beam when the, the case hits against this angled surface and smacks it out of the way. This is a beautiful system. And of course, Uzi extractors are very available and uh, just a nice thing to use. I think I definitely want to do that, but who knows when I'll make time for it. But I think this would make a really nice, functioning, reliable gun. We don't have the super thin section there where it's going to crack, so that's nice. Okay, who doesn't love a good whiteboard discussion, huh? All right, what I was talking about with the extractor, uh, let's make our stupid looking extractor here. All right, uh, so the force the extractor feels when the rim 
the cartridge rim, yeah, this is this looks just like a nine millimeter too, doesn't it? It's a great drawing. Oh Jesus! Oh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, all right, so. Abortions are terrible. <laughs> God dang it. Alright. So, rim. Of course, it actually goes like this. that we're not even gonna put we're not even gonna put the head up the bullet on it anyway the force you feel here the force the extractor gets is coming off the rim so right there is a the line of force so it's pushing there and if you look at the line of action of that force it's below the pivot point of the extractor. So if you pull on here, this wants to rotate like this. And that of course makes it want to unhook. Now if you actually had the pivot point down here, like if you if you just did this to your design and then put the pivot point down here, you could have the line of action actually go through it or go on the other side of it. So when you put force on this from the rim, it actually wants to pull it down and, and get tighter. Now you can do that, obviously, and something like the Uzi that doesn't have a pivot point, it, it has some tendency to pivot just because it it will want to bend, but it's, it takes a lot. But the uh, closer you get the pivot point to the line of action of the force that the rim exerts on the extractor hook, the closer that pivot point is, the less tendency you, ha you have to want the uh, this force to snap the extractor off of the rim. So that's why, like, Royal Nonsuch sent me the bolt for his RN9 uh, a couple years back, and his pivot point was, like, like way out here. So he, he was just wanting to pivot it out so easily. And it's one of those things, you, if you don't know about it, if nobody's ever pointed it out, it's not necessarily obvious, but uh, it, makes, it definitely makes a difference. Okay, in the next video, I'll go ahead and do the changes I was talking about to the ROF extractor, which is cutting that slot a little deeper and machining off a little bit and make sure it's a little more positive and uh, grabbing onto that rim. And then we'll go over and see how that works as far as firing and all that. And of course, that video will be instantly de be demonetized because it'll show gun stuff and firing and all that. But this one, we'll just cross our fingers and hope it doesn't get demonetized. But <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. Well, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I go through a lot of trouble to make these videos and it's definitely not worth my while, but I love teaching this stuff. It's really interesting to me and I know a lot of you guys like it, so I share when I can. Uh, you know, my daughter would kill me if she knew I was doing this stuff on the weekend instead of trying to get caught up like we're supposed to. We're so far behind here, but, uh, you know, um, the show must go on. But uh, please consider supporting my Patreon channel. Even if you can just give a dollar a month, three dollars a month, whatever. I mean, it all helps because ultimately, if I can offload the video work and the editing work off onto somebody who does this for a living, it, it would be so much better for me and for all of us, right? Again, thank you. Hit that like button, subscribe if you would, and I'll see you next time.